the battles I would face Forever running but losing the race Were it not for grace So here is all my plea Express with all my heart Offer to a friend took my place and ran the course I could not start and when he saw in full just how much heaven would be lost he still went the extra I can tell you where I'd be winding down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go. The battles I would face Forever running But losing the race Were it not for grace Forever running But losing Good evening, everyone, and thank you for that special music. Very beautiful. Don't you love it when Ecclesiastes, it's 11, 8, it says, The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Praise God, because we have a mighty Redeemer who is all power and all strength. Tonight we're going to go on a journey, a journey through our gastrointestinal tract, starting at the mouth and going all the way down to the other end. It's an interesting journey. It is a journey that many are not familiar with and how important it is to know something about the house we live in. When I was 17 and got my learners, my father said I had to learn how an engine worked before I got my license. I was not very happy with this because none of my girlfriends had to learn how an engine worked before they got their license. There was my brother, then me, and then three girls. I was the first girl. And every night I had to sit down with dad and he taught me about pistons and spark plugs and stuff like that. Sorry, I can't tell you the detail. But how much sense does that make? How important to know just a little bit. There was no need for me to get, get as much knowledge as the mechanic. But how important just to know a little bit 
about the car I was going to drive. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But how much more important it is to know something about the body that we are living in. Proverbs 14 verse 6 says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. So my aim is to give you an understanding of the gastrointestinal tract. And when you understand how the gastrointestinal tract works, you automatically have the knowledge on how to treat it. And that enables each one of us to be our own doctor, which I believe we should be. It doesn't mean you don't go to the doctor. It doesn't mean you don't go to the naturopath. It doesn't, it mean, doesn't mean you don't go to the specialist. They are your advisors. And what can you do with that advice? You can take it or leave it. But the Bible says to prove all things in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. If it works, do it. If it doesn't work, adjust till it does. But remember, there might need a little bit of time for it to actually have an effect. And so Galatians 6 verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. And Hebrews 10.35 says, Cast not away therefore thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, in that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. And in page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, the author states that nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. What is it? Gradual. And to the impatient it seems slow. <laughs> but in the end it will be found that nature untrammeled does her work wisely and well. Give it a little bit of time. Give it time to work. Yesterday we looked at hot and cold water treatments. Now, they can work pretty fast. They can bring relief pretty fast. They can boost blood into the area to bring relief. That is true. But the total healing can take a little time. Our gastrointestinal tract, now, I go by metres in Australia, and I think a metre is about your yard. And I think three feet is a yard, is that right? So our gastrointestinal tract is eight metres long, so that would be eight yards long. Is that right? That, that's a long area, isn't it? When I worked in the operating theatre and the surgeon would open, this, open the abdominal area and then he would pull all the intestines out like this, like ropes, and he would just dump it on a cloth, sterile cloth, and then he might be operating on the... Um, on the uterus, something like that. And when he'd finished the operation, he'd get all the intestines and poke them back in like that. He didn't carefully place them. I used to be watching and, yeah, shove them in, sew it up. <laughs> it, it, it's a long area. It's a long area. Dogs have one yard long. It's in and out quick. But, a, but humans, it's eight yards long that's eight meters long so let's begin at the mouth the mouth is where everything goes in and the mouth is the only part we have say over we have say over what goes in we have say over how much goes in we have say over when it goes in we have say over how long it actually stays in the mouth, whether it's chew, to chew, swallow, to chew, swallow, or whether it's chewed efficiently and effectively. And we also have say, oh, the environment upon entry, whether it's a stressful environment or whether it's a peaceful environment. Now, the say we have over those five points affects, as you will see, all the way down the gastrointestinal tract. There are no teeth in our stomach and the teeth are the only exposed bone in the body and the teeth are designed to chew. And when you're eating a meal, I want you to remember the old steam train. Chew, 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 chew. We should chew and we should chew very well. And our knife and fork should really go down between each mouthful. 
so that we can chew very, very well. Why is it important to chew? It's important to chew because there's no teeth anyway down. So the only, if you don't do chewing there, there's nowhere else the chewing can happen. So we need to chew, chew, chew. The old saying says we should drink our food and chew our drinks. You've heard of that? That's why I say to the guests when they're juicing, take a mouthful and swish it around in the mouth and swallow it. Well, how do we drink our food? We chew it until it's a cream. My husband's not very good at that. Everything Michael does is fast. He drives fast. I don't mind, I like fast. <laughs> to Michael, an orange light means put your foot down. <laughs> Everything's fast, and in some areas I'm very glad of that. But he eats very fast. So I often touch his arm and smile, and he knows immediately what I mean, and he goes, oh, ah, right. <laughs> it's a very good husband. He does just what he's told. <laughs> you see, I'm his doctor, and he's got to listen. <laughs> So be careful. And we are such a fast society. I was in the car today and I looked over and there's a lady in the car eating. <laughs> when you eat and read, when you eat and watch something on a screen, when you're eating and doing something, the energies that should go to your digestion in your stomach have a little bit of a war. They're being pulled away to other areas. I read in uh, Ellen, one of Ellen Wright's writings once where she said cast off care and anxious thought when you sit to dine when you're stressed it interferes with the release of your hydrochloric acid we're going to go down there in the stomach in a minute and see what that does chewing not only makes it easier all the way down the gastrointestinal tract chewing gives messages to the brain when you're chewing sensors are going to the brain and it says, ah, oh, there's a bit of fat in there, ah, oh, there's a bit of protein in there, ah, oh, there's a bit of carbohydrate in there. And then the brain says messages further down to the other organs saying, yeah, there's a bit of fat coming, ah, oh, yeah, and there's a bit of protein coming and it allows them to get ready. And if the person goes choo-choo swallow, choo-choo swallow, the organs are saying, what's coming? And the brain says, I don't know. They're chewing fa so fast I can hardly get, get a message through. Chewing also creates a larger surface area. And a larger surface area means more contact for the enzymes to work on and be able to break the food down. So the first organ we're looking at is the mouth. And the pH in the mouth is alkaline. And there are two types of food that are broken down in the mouth. Most people don't realize that digestion does begin in the mouth. And one is a salivary amylase called tylen. And tylen breaks down starch. Another word for starch is your carbohydrates. So that's all your grains, your cereals, your breads, your potatoes, um, pastas, things like that, starch. This morning we looked at child nutrition and I showed how tylen is not present in the mouth until the molars are through. So a baby does not have tylen. And when the first teeth come, that's four at the top, four at the bottom, there's no tylen. They're traditionally called milk teeth because that's what babies should have, milk. Maybe a little bit of a taste, maybe a suck on an apple, a suck on a cucumber, something like that. But when the molars come through, that would be anywhere between 14 and 22 months of age, then tylen is released and tylen breaks down starch. So babies should not have any starch until the molars are fully through. Traditionally, babies were never fed food. It's only a recent thing, giving babies food. When they can sit, when they can feed themselves, they've often only got four or maybe five or six 
of the front teeth. So you just give them little things to suck on. A good one is, is cutting off or chewing off all the corn off a cob of corn and give them, give them the centre. Oh, they love that. It's just the right size and they suck on it and they think they're doing what you're doing then. You're eating a whole meal and they're just sucking on, on something like that. One lady said it's, it's just wonderful because babies are very social creatures. They want to do what we're doing. But if they don't have the molars, they don't have the tylen, so they cannot break the food down. And they're just babies. You know, you could almost give them a, a block of wood to chew on and they think they're doing what you're doing. One, one lady emailed me, she said, my baby wants to eat. I said, your baby doesn't know nothing. <laughs> He just wants to do what you're doing, but if there's no teeth to break down the starch, don't give it to them. That can set up gut problems even later in life. So starch is broken down by tylen. Well, it's begun there. The other enzyme is lingual lipase. Underneath our tongue, there are glands. There's a gland and it's called the sublingual gland. So underneath the tongue, there's the sublingual gland and it releases lingual lipase. And lingual lipase is the enzyme that breaks down saturated fat. On Saturday afternoon at five o'clock, I'm going to give a meeting called Fantastic Fats, where I will show you the basic structure of the fats. So I'm going to look at it in detail now. Then, but the saturated fat that is one of the best we can eat is coconut. Now, about a year ago, uh, it had on social media the drug and the drug and food the FDA. They said, "Careful on the coconut oil. We're just discovering it's not as safe as we thought." How much coconut does America grow? No. So, what do they want you to eat? They want you to eat the, the oils that they grow. Because you go to the South Pacific Islands, they've been eating coconut for thousands of years. Incredible health. So can you see what we're using here? We're using history. We're using common sense. And on Sunday afternoon, I'll show you the science. So when I was in Fiji, I was speaking in Suva to 5,000 people. This is a couple of years ago. There were two layers in the huge auditorium. So one layer was watching me on a screen. I spoke, and at the end, I took questions. And one lady said, Barbara, we're told that the coconut is bad. What are your thoughts on the coconut? I said, were your ancestors healthy? Oh, there's a very rigorous nodding of heads. Our ancestors were the finest specimens of humanity, absolutely. And they're right. I said, what did they eat every meal? There was silence. Then the laughter started. That's how ridiculous it is. They had coconut every single meal. And they had incredible health. So can you see we've got some history there? The coconut is quite an incredible fat because the breakdown begins in the mouth. So all your saturated fats breakdown begins in the mouth. So there's your coconut, there's your palm oil. Is palm oil a problem? With palm oil, it has a similar effect to coconut oil. The problem with palm oil is it's an ethical issue because they're cutting down rainforests to grow the palm oil plant to make lots of chocolate for the people in the cities that want to eat chocolate. So it's really an ethical issue. But nutritionally on the body, the palm oil is similar to the coconut oil. Shea butter, also just straight butter. These are saturated fats. And tomorrow night I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you scientifically that saturated fat and cholesterol do not cause heart disease. It's a myth. We've been deceived again. So the saturated fat is unique in that the breakdown begins in the mouth. Now we're going to go through a little sphincter here, the little gateway into the stomach. It's called the cardiac sphincter. And the reason it's called the cardiac sphincter because it's of its relationship or nearness to the cardiac muscle, which is the heart. Now sometimes some people suffer from reflux. You've heard that? or heartburn, or GERDs. 
And what do they put on if that is so? Antacids? Because the acid's coming up and burning. Well, as you will see as we move down into the stomach, the stomach is an acid environment. And that is very important. It's very important because only in an acid environment can the food be broken down properly. So to give someone antacid because they've got reflux and the acid comes up is like shooting all the horses because they keep getting out of the gateway. Just shut the gate. Just shut the gate. The acid's not the problem. The acid's necessary for digestion. The problem's the gate. So what's my next question? Where's my resident? Why? We'll put why up in this corner because it ever must be on our lips. Why is it coming up? Well, let's have a look at the structure of our abdomen. We have a muscle that goes across like that called the diaphragm. You familiar with the diaphragm? Now, right in the middle of the diaphragm is the cardiac sphincter. So if that diaphragm, if those abdominal muscles are weak, if the diaphragm's weak, then the cardiac sphincter is going to be weak and it is not going to close properly. Can you see that? So if someone goes to the doctor with reflux, will the doctor inquire about the strength of his abdominal muscles? <laughs> the strength of his diaphragm? If you were to learn singing, your first lesson you are taught to breathe with your, your abdominal muscles, your diaphragm. To do that, you have to stand tall. When you're standing with a hunch back, then it's impossible to use your abdominal muscles in the breathing process, and little by little, the abdominal muscles get weak. So it's very important to do your crunches. Do you do crunches every morning? They're so easy. You just have to lift it. Lift your head. That's all you have to do. You don't have to sit, do sit-ups like the 18-year-olds. Well, maybe after you've done crunches for six months, you will be doing sit-ups. Every day we should do our crunches to strengthen those abdominal wall. Muscle knows no age. Whether you're 9 or 90, you can have strong muscles. So anyone with GERDs or reflux or heartburn, it's time to do your crunches. It's time to build up and strengthen your abdominal muscles. And push-ups. Can't do push-ups? Start on the wall. And the further out you go, the harder it is. And once you're able to do 50 on the wall, then it's time maybe you can go down to the floor and start to do your push-ups on the floor. We need to be doing these every single day. So strengthen those muscles, which will strengthen the diaphragm. Be mindful that you're breathing with your abdominal muscles. No high chest breathing. Breathe with your abdominal muscles and it will strengthen your diaphragm, which will strengthen your cardiac sphincter. Your cardiac sphincter is a muscle and when it's relaxed, it's closed. And when it tightens, it opens. So when someone's stressed, it can tighten that cardiac sphincter and open it and the food can come up. And sorry, but... a, a a very bad habit. I say sorry because it's so common in America and Australia of eating breakfast like a pauper and lunch like a pauper and, and supper is the king and the queen together. So that's a huge meal at the end of the day. Then the person lies down to sleep and what does gravity do? Pushes that up and weakens it. So these are the, some of the things to be mindful if someone has reflux. So to close that little gate, magnesium. So they can take magnesium, ideally citrate, magnesium citrate, morning, in the middle of the day, at the end of the day, and just before bed. And that will help to close that. And have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and supper like a pauper. And remember, sometimes paupers don't eat. And that will heal GERDs, reflux, or heartburn. So now we're in the stomach, and the stomach is lined with big folds that look like this. And those folds are lined with gastric glands. And those gastric glands, two-thirds of them, release mucus. And that mucus is designed to give a thick mucosa wall over the stomach. 
because down here in the parietal glands, right in the corner here, so these two thirds release mucus, down here the glands release hydrochloric acid. You will notice in my book there's a chapter. It's called The Stomach's Secret Weapon, Hydrochloric Acid. If someone says I've got a very acid stomach, I say fantastic. It's supposed to be. And I have never met anyone with too much acid in their stomach. So I say, what makes you think you've got too much acid? Well, it keeps coming up. Well, the problem's not the acid. The problem's the little gateway. If we had too much stomach, our stomach lining would be burnt out. But God gave us this thick mucosa wall so it doesn't burn. Did you know that dogs have six times the hydrochloric acid that humans have? And did you know that dogs don't get heartburn or reflux or stomach ulcer? Uh-huh. If you had too much acid, you'd be digesting your food about every two hours. It's actually a non-event, too much acid. I had a man do our program who had been on Nexium or the like for 25 years. <clears throat> is it working? 25 years. Ah, body didn't take that long to heal. Hmm? It doesn't make any sense. And you know there's been a death because no one went, went to the funeral because no one knew he died. It was the death of common sense. Yeah. <laughs> Let's revive common sense. So why do I call hydrochloric acid the stomach's secret weapon? If you eat food that happens to have bacteria or yeast on it and it gets into the stomach, the hydrochloric acid will kill it. Hydrochloric acid, one of its roles is that of antibacterial, antifungal. In fact, the only people that get food poisoning are people with low hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric has, acid has another role. And it connects with pepsinogen. And pepsinogen, they unite and release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. This is what happens in the stomach. Pepsin breaks down protein. But can you see what's got to happen to release the pepsin? There has to be a very acid environment for the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen to unite. And pepsin will only work in a very acid environment. So the stomach must be acid. I have a book at home on the physiology of digestion and this book was written in 1833. I read about the story in an in a anatomy and physiology book. I read about it again in a magazine and I got the name of it and Amazon found the book for me in a, in a Arun State College Library. I was charged 20 cents and it cost $20 to get it to me. <laughs> the book was written by Dr. William Beaumont. Let me give you the story. It's fascinating. Dr. William Beaumont was called to an accident in a trading store. A young man named Alexis St. Martin, who was only 18, sustained a gunshot wound to the stomach. A gun went off, was an accident, and shot through part of his stomach, shot out part of his stomach and some of his ribs. Dr. Bowman was called. He was only 25 at the time. He was the resident doctor in the town. He assessed Alexis St. Martin and said he would not live. But he was taken to hospital. He was basically patched up. They put a a swab on the area. And every day when Dr. Beaumont visited, this young man was healing. Four times a tumour rose, burst, and a two-inch piece of rib came out. Now what would have happened if the tumour rose, he was given antibiotics and it was pushed back in? Isn't that interesting? Why did the body make that tumour? To get rid of that piece of rib because remember the gunshot wound went here after that it healed but there was always a hole in his stomach so what Dr. Beaumont did he put a he put a pad over it but as Alexis St. Martin healed a little 
skin flap sort of grew over it. And Dr. Beaumont saw his opportunity. In fact, to the point where he invited Alexis St. Martin to live with him. And what he would do, he would put a piece of food on a silk thread into the hole. And then he would take it out after an hour and have a look at it, put it back in, take it out after two hours, put it back in, take it out. And his findings changed the nutrition world. And he found, in fact, in the book, the first third of the book is the story, Alexis St. Martin lived till he was 80. He actually married, had children. Dr. Beaumont said he could have stitched that wound, but Alexis St. Martin got to the point where he said, no, no, I don't want you to do anything more to me. And this little hole was about here. And in the book I have, there are pencil drawings. And the pencil drawing shows the hole with sort of folds coming out of it like that. So here's his, um, here's his pectoral muscles. So there's the nipple on the pectoral muscle and it sort of sits about there. The last part of the book are the documented research. And he meticulously documented his research. And all through the book I've written down four hours, five hours, three and a half hours. What Dr. Beaumont found is that digestion averaged three and a half to four hours. He also noticed that the stomach loved a rest of one hour. So what's that between meals? That's five to six hours between meals. Now this was 18, 1833 this book was written. That sounds very familiar to the most popular way of eating today. Have you heard of it? Uh, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. Do you know what they're saying now? We should eat two meals six hours apart in a 24-hour period. Isn't that interesting? Oh, no, we don't, don't agree with eating all day long. Wasn't, wasn't that 10 years ago? You had to graze all day long? Actually, that makes absolutely no sense. Cows can graze all day long because they've got four stomachs. We've only got one. But Dr. Beaumont found that there were five things that caused the food to be still in the stomach eight hours later. Because remember, he had this direct access and could test how long the food was in there. So what are the five things that caused the food to be still in the stomach eight hours later? If Alexis St. Martin overate, how many people feel like eating an evening meal on the evening of the 25th of December. Not many, because they've eaten huge, large Christmas Day lunch. Is that right? What Dr. Beaumont found, that if Alexis and Martin ate like that, the food was still in his stomach eight hours later. It's almost as if so much digestive juices are released in the stomach, so if too much food goes in, it just can't get through it. He also discovered if he often ate. Now this totally refutes the theory that has been going on for many years to graze. Eat every couple of hours. And one of their reasons is don't overburden the stomach. Well that's almost going from one extreme to the other. You see, the pyloric sphincter, which is the gate at the end, it has little sensors. And these little sensors sense whether the food's been broken down or not. And when it's been broken down to a certain state, then the pyloric sphincter opens and little by little the food goes through. So let's say breakfast is going through and let's say about 9.30, 10 in the morning, the person does what many Aussies do. Mid-morning, they have a cup of coffee and a, and a cake, yeah? A cup of coffee and... A, a sandwich or a pasty or a pie or maybe they're really healthy and it's an apple and a handful of nuts, whatever it is. As soon as it comes in, pyloric sphincter gets the message, quick, shut the gate, something's just come in and it's not broken down. It might take a couple of hours for it to, to get broken down and join, it, 
join the rest of breakfast that hasn't been able to move because nothing could happen until the newcomer was broken down. And so more gets broken down. We're down to about this. Oh no, lunch comes in. Quick, shut the gate. Something's just come in. It's not broken down. No wonder if Alexis St. Martin ate every couple of hours, there was still some of breakfast in the stomach right at the end of the day, eight hours later. He also found there was food in the stomach if he had large fluid with the meal. And this is such an American and Australian habit, isn't that right? Drinking with the meal. We're such a fast society. People are running every, running everywhere. They forgot to drink. They sit to eat and they drink. What does water do to acid? It dilutes it. So when you're drinking large amounts of fluid with the meal, you're watering down your hydrochloric acid. No wonder the food was still in the stomach at the end of the day when he ate large fluid because it waters down the hydrochloric acid. Uh, and Dr. Beaumont found that when, the, when large water came in, digestion stopped, the stomach had to get rid of the water, bring it back to its acid condition so that it could break the protein down. Also, stress. If he was anxious, that interfered with the production of hydrochloric acid. Sometimes he'd get a little bit annoyed at Dr. Beaumont keep putting bits of food into his... <laughs> But Dr. Beaumont found the only time he got really annoyed is if he'd had alcohol the day before or that night before. And that's the fifth one, alcohol. If he had alcohol with the meal, that drastically reduced his stomach ability to break down food. And how many Americans are doing all of that? No wonder we have so many stomach problems today. And some people think that children, they're little, they need to eat all day long. No, no, no. My children would sit and eat a big salad and their vegetables and my girlfriend would say, how come your kids eat that? Why don't my kids eat that? And I said, well, it's got something to do with the chocolate you gave them an hour ago. As if, as if they're going to eat the meal if they've just had snacks. We don't do snacks. The best snack is a glass of water. We should stop drinking half an hour before the meal and we should resume drinking about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. If you sit to the meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink with your meal. Try it. So that's the only thing that gets broken down in the stomach. What about B12? Do you remember those big folds I just showed you? Well, down here, not only is hydrochloric acid released and pepsinogen, but also the intrinsic factor. And the intrinsic factor is required to absorb B12. So let me give you the B12 story. Let's say my thumb is B12. In food, it's connected with the R protein. And when it comes into the stomach, hydrochloric acid breaks that union. Now, if someone's low in hydrochloric acid, can you see that the R protein and the B12 can't be broken? So in the stomach, intrinsic factor is released. Here's intrinsic factor. Now, B12 and intrinsic factor, they float along together all through the small intestine. Coming down to the ileum, the last part of the small intestine, intrinsic factor and B12 connect and that enables the B12 to be absorbed. And when it's absorbed, it goes into the enterohepatic circulation. Hepatic means liver. This is a circulation between the liver and the ileum. And that circulation, it stays in that circulation until it's needed. Do you know what this means? Someone can have no B12 in their diet for 30 years before they show a deficiency. What is B12? It's an airborne bacteria. So you're going to find it in rainwater tanks. You're going to find B12 on homegrown vegetables. When you eat an apple straight off a tree, you're getting B12. It's an airborne bacteria. Dr. Neil Nedley in his book, Proof Positive, he shows the research that shows that B12 
is on organically grown root vegetables. Remember, it's a bacteria. Interesting. Meat eaters and vegetarians and vegans alike can all suffer from B12 deficiency. But the main cause of the deficiency is low hydrochloric acid and lack of intrinsic factor. Why? Because people are eating all day long, they're eating the largest meal at the end of the day, they're drinking with their meals, they're stressed all the way along. Interesting. Reminds me of the proverb, 14 verse 6, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. So if someone has low B12, I immediately looking at boosting their hydrochloric acid. So how can you boost hydrochloric acid? Eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and supper like a pauper. Drink between your meals and not with your meals. Relax when you're eating. If I get a phone call in the middle of the meal, I say, I'm sorry, but I'm busy. This is a very important part of the day. I'll ring back in half an hour. Sit, and that's why, and I said this morning when we looked at child nutrition, if there's a child at my table that's making a fuss, they leave the room. And if you only feed them twice a day, guess where they want to be? At the table. They learn quickly. You never yell, you never raise your voice. You're always incredibly polite. But, but remove them very swiftly before anyone's got the chance to get irritated enough to yell. Mm -hmm. How can you boost hydrochloric acid? You can take a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little water just before you begin to eat. When we looked at natural remedies, we looked at the wonders of cayenne pepper. That cayenne pepper will wake anything up. <laughs> you can also have the juice of a lemon in a little hot water just before the meal. Dr. Kellogg, famous doctor who wrote many books on health, he says, have a little quarter of a cup of very hot water just before the meal. The hot water in the stomach will cause a stimulating release of your digestive enzymes. But we use a tea, and the tea is recipes in my book. It's dandelion. It's a, it's a group of bitter herbs. Dandelion. That's a bitter herb. Gentian is a very bitter herb. Licorice. Licorice is an emollient, so it not coats and soothes the, the uh, gut. This is one part dandelion, one part gentian, one part licorice, and half a part golden seal. Golden seal is called the king of tonics to all mucous membranes. These are all roots. You dry, buy them as dried roots. You mix it in a jar. And one teaspoon of the herbs and one teaspoon of fresh ginger. And that is to two cups of water. And then it should gen a gentle simmer for, say, simmer for, say, 10 minutes. The dose is to take a, about a third of a cup hot just before you eat. I had a lady ring me and she said, Barbara, I've been, we call it digestive tea. I've been using your digestive tea for a month now. And my digestion has so improved. She said, I've been on digestive enzymes for years. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14? God gave herbs for the service of man. Different herbs have different effects on different body parts. Tomorrow morning we're going to be looking at herbs in our 10 to 12 lecture. That's how you can boost. Now remember, the cells in your body can get into habits. I'll tell you my story briefly. I, my first husband was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And life was tough in the rainforest. And sometimes he would get very angry. And a mother always tries and protects her little ones. And what I found was that bit by bit, my hydrochloric acid was depleting. 
I didn't realise it. 1993, I had to leave my mountain home with my children. I was a single mother for four years. Six months after I left home, I went to the doctor because I had a, I had a lump in my chest. She tested, she did a scan, she said, it's just a cyst. She said, can I do a blood test on you? When she did a blood test, my iron level was very, very low. Your iron level should be, that's your HB, should be between probably 11 and 13, 14. Mine was eight. She said, are you tired? I said, oh, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> I'd been through a lot of stress leaving home. We had to flee our mountain home. With so much happening, I, you know, I was just used to pushing on. So let me fast forward. 15 years later, I'm still on iron tablets. Once I stopped the iron tablets because I thought I was growing quite well. I was getting very, very tired after a while and I had a blood test because my sister said, if you're tired, have a blood test. I was, hemoglobin was 5.4, death is three. I had to have a blood transfusion for the saving of my life. I went in white and I came out of that hospital pink. <laughs> I hardly had any blood in me. Now this totally puzzled me because my children were eating what I was eating. At that point, I didn't realize I had low hydrochloric acid. I went to specialists. I went to <laughs> hematologists. No one could find out why my iron was so low. And then I went to my anatomy and physiology books. And I was studying, because I was going to give a series of meetings, I thought, I just want to know a little bit more about iron. And there I discovered it that iron is bound up in food and it needs acid to free it from food. I would be still full five hours after a meal. That is a clear sign of low hydrochloric acid. My food was not being digested. And I also discovered another thing they found a problem that I had was I had low ferritin levels. Now low ferritin is low iron stores. So my problem was I had low iron in the blood and I had low iron stores. And that's why they gave me a blood transfusion. They said, you have an accident, you're dead because you've got nothing there. And then I discovered that ferritin is iron store, but the body stores iron with protein. And protein is broken down in the stomach. So when you don't have enough acid, not only can't you free iron from food, but you can't break down your protein, so there's no protein to store the iron. Oh, you know, sometimes the light bulb goes off. And so I put this tea together. I put the tea together and I began to have it. Before every meal, I'd have a third of a cup of this hot tea. After three months, I decided to have a blood test to check my levels. My hemoglobin was 12. It had never been 12. My B12 was off the chart. My ferritin levels way up high. 15 years, I'd been on and off iron tablets. And all anyone could say to me is, you need to have another um, test to see if you're bleeding. I said, I'm not bleeding. <laughs> It was so frustrating, and yet how simple was that? And so I put this tea together, and everyone that has anemia, we had a girl come with anemia, and they had her on antacids. Whew. Well, I suggested she stop them immediately, and we put her on the digestive tea to boost that acid, because when your hydrochloric acid's good, it'll free the iron from the food, it'll break down your protein so that you can store your iron as ferritin. It's as simple as that. We've been, now this, that story I just told you was probably about 12 years ago now. What happened then, I started running up hills. My hair grew to my waist. I had energy. So many things, all because I boosted my hydrochloric acid. So I don't think that I'm being presumptuous to say that I'm an expert on hydrochloric acid. So let's move through now to 
through the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is the gateway from the stomach into the duodenum. And the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. And there's a lot happening in the duodenum. And the duodenum is an alkaline environment. Can you see the only part of the body that should be acid is the stomach? And can you also see that the only thing that is broken down in the stomach is protein? There's nothing else that's broken down in the stomach. And it must have an acid environment for it to be broken down, for the pepsin to work. So now we're getting down to the duodenum. Now look what's happening in the duodenum. We've got the liver and underneath the liver is the gallbladder and the bile duct takes the bile down to the neck of the pancreas and then it's released into the duodenum. Let's have a look at what that does. It is the liver that makes bile. The gallbladder is just the reservoir that holds the bile. And the liver releases bile. And the bile breaks down unsaturated fats. So there's your polyunsaturated fats. So these are probably the majority of fats that are in your nuts and your seeds. Then we've got the pancreas. Let's look at what the pancreas does. The pancreas releases pancreatic lipase. Lipase is the enzyme that breaks down fat. So bile emulsifies the unsaturated fat down to tiny particles and the pancreatic lipase further breaks it down. The pancreas also releases pancreatic amylase. Now let's go back to the mouth for a moment. Do you remember what salivary amylase was? Tylen. So tylen is salivary amylase and it began starch digestion. It all got put on hold in the stomach because what sort of environment is the stomach? Acid. And now it's revived again in the duodenum where you're back to alkaline. Did you know that the pancreas also releases sodium bicarbonate? to quickly bring about an alkaline environment here. And pancreatic amylase finalizes starch digestion. So can you see that? It was begun in the mouth, put on hold till it gets to the duodenum, and then the pancreas releases pancreatic amylase, which will finalize starch digestion. There's more. The pancreas also releases trypsin, and trypsin is an enzyme that breaks down protein. Now, where did protein digestion begin? Stomach. Pancreas also releases chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin is another enzyme that breaks down protein. Let me show you protein. Here's protein. That's protein. And in the stomach, under the action of pepsin, the protein is broken down to peptides and polypeptides. And then the peptides and the polypeptides come down to the duodenum and trypsin and chymotrypsin break the peptides down to amino acids, the polypeptides down to amino acid and peptides, then amino acids. So protein digestion begins in the stomach and it's further broken down in the duodenum under the action of trypsin and chymotrypsin. Let me show you something. Let's say the person is uh, eating very quickly, drinking with their meals, eating all day long. That reduces hydrochloric acid. And so in the stomach, not all the protein gets broken down to peptides and polypeptides. Maybe only half does. Then it comes down into the duodenum. And the pancreas says, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be down to peptides and polypeptides. And protein says, sorry, but they're drinking with their meals. They're eating all day long. They're stressed out. 
there's not enough hydrochloric acid. And so trypsin and chymotrypsin do the best they can and sometimes all they can do is bring it down to peptides and polypeptides, maybe a couple of amino acids. Halfway down the small intestines, all the nutrients should be absorbed. But only amino acids can be absorbed out of the gut and into the blood. And so the peptides and the polypeptides come all the way down to the large colon. And the colon says, what are you doing here? They said, sorry, but they're drinking with their meals, they're eating all day long, they're having their largest meal at the end of the day, they're stressed out with their meals, <gasps> says the colon. So what the colon has to do now is create extra bacteria to calm this down and try and break it down a little bit by the time it gets out and that creates a lot of gas. You've heard of that? A lot of wind and a lot of gas. Most people that have wind and gas, it's because they're chewing too quickly and they're drinking with their meals and they've got low hydrochloric acid. A typical sign is a lot of bloating. It should not be. And so many people have been bloating so long that they almost think, this is what I do. It's normal. But not so. Not so. The enzymes that break down protein are pepsin, trypsin and chymotrypsin. They are called proteolytic enzymes. They're proteolytic enzymes. God in his wisdom and mercy has put some proteolytic enzymes in foods. And in the core of the pineapple, there's an enzyme called bromelain and it is a proteolytic enzyme. In the papaya, an extract of the papaya is papain and papain is a proteolytic enzyme. So these proteolytic enzymes help to break down the protein. Before I explain more on that, I have a question for you students. Which organ is the main organ of digestion. Mm -hmm. And most people, now it is true, the mouth's important, the stomach's important, as I showed you, but the main organ of digestion is the pancreas. And this explains why if someone has pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis, they often die very, very quickly from malnutrition. See, anything that goes in your gastrointestinal tract does not become part of you or me until it gets absorbed into the blood. Now it becomes part of you and me because Leviticus 17.11 states that the life of the flesh is in the blood. But your gut is a hollow tube. It's not part of you until those, those food particles are broken down to singular structures, absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you. So if the pancreas is down, which means the pancreatic lipase can't do its role on the fats, which means the pancreatic amylase can't, finalize the starch digestion, bringing it down to singular glucose, which means the trypsin and the trimotrypsin can't finalize protein, so the nutrients in the food are not getting into the blood, they're being passed out in the bathroom. In fact, often if a person gets diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, often they're gone in five weeks. So if someone has pancreatic problems, pancreatitis, pancre pancreatic cancer, one of the first things they must do is get some enzymes. And you will find that vet get some vegetarian enzymes. Be cautious of other digestive enzymes that have porcine in it. What, where do you think porcine comes from? Pork. 
so I do not advise that. It's taken from the stomach of the pig, so be careful of that name, but just buy vegetarian digestive enzymes and you will find they have bromelain in them, they have papain, sometimes they have gentian, remember that herb that was in the digestive tea? And sometimes they have an amylase in it that's been created by a culturing process. So these digestive enzymes are essential when someone has pancreatic problems to help them digest their food. <coughs> Allowing their pancreas to heal. And it will heal when it's given the right conditions. It is now 8 o'clock. I'm going to have a break now. But before we have the break, um, I have a sister here who has something to happen. And when we come back from the break, we're going to look at the grand finale of digestion. So I'll hand it over to Sister Cavill. Yes, at this time we are going to lift the evening's offering. Um, can the uh, ushers come forward, please? We also encourage those who are viewing us online that they too can play a part, that they can uh, go to the website. They have to do, a, uh, do an offering at www.sunrisesda.org. And there you can um, give your offering. OK, let us, let us bow heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. We know that you are the giver of all good gifts. We pray now that as we lift this evening's offering, that you will bless it, that you will multiply it, and that it will go to the furtherance of your cause. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are bringing this program to you and um, so that we can get information. We don't charge for the program, but we're asking you to give a generous offering so we can support the program. We also have the health fair, which is Sunday, and um, I'm gonna show you just a little clip of something from the health fair. So we ask you to help us, because we're, we're brothers and sisters working together. And the, when you do your best, then the Lord will do the rest. This is from last year. Yeah. Did you know that this truck's bulletproof? Yes, it's 
it's like something that would be. It's full, the windows are bulletproof, everything's what? all good. Thank you very much, Sunrise. It's such a great um, event that you guys put on for the community with a lot of information, etc. Information that people need. And, you know, as a fellow Adventist, I come with my family and I enjoy myself. But I'm also a vendor. I work with Western and Southern Life. But we do life insurance, critical illness, the whole nine yards. Oh, wonderful. And prepare, you know, families to protect themselves and their loved ones. So this is really awesome. And, um, I saw the crowd and I stopped by and I appreciate what they did. It's good, exciting, very interesting. Very Enjoy the soup. Hello. Uh, very good and nutritious. Okay. It's wonderful to know that Sunrise SDA Church has this welfare every year and all the community come out and we thank God for this experience. Very, very nice and happy to be here because it's a nice sunny day. It's not a nice sunny day for me. Have a pleasant It's just super too. I am enjoying it to the fullest. Good. And uh, I think it's very helpful. Yes. You know, the, all the, the things they have for free, you know. Yeah, I think really it's good. nice for the it's community. Really yeah. And there is a lot of information. A lot of information. <laughs> So you see the fair, we are inviting you to come to the health fair because we make it for you. So I know people have a lot of scare about um, the coronavirus, but we are health persons. And we are gonna tell you how, and Barbara has even been telling you how you can prevent it. We are not a people of fear. And at the, at the health fair, we're gonna show you how you can make your natural sanitizer. We're gonna give you um, blood, uh, how to boost your immune system. So you need to come out and show the community that we are here to teach them how to live healthy. Very interesting. That's good. Let's, let's come back now to our gastrointestinal tract. In fact, the gastrointestinal tract is so important that that strong hydrochloric acid, you'll find that that is, that is a real booster to your immune system. But I mentioned before the break that we're now coming to the grand finale of digestion. And believe it or not, this is where your immune system is made. So remember I said that most of your food is absorbed halfway down your small intestine. The small intestine is, is covered with little villi that look like this. And up the middle of the villi is a lymphatic vessel. And then all through the villi are little blood, blood capillaries. Remember I said anything that goes into your gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets absorbed through to the blood or to the, to the lymphatic system. 
most goes into the blood, as you will see. When we were in our mother's wombs, our gut was sterile. But when we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. And in colostrum, that's the thick yellow substance that's in women's breasts for three days before the milk comes through, that is very rich in microbes. I'm sure most of, it have, most of us have heard of the lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacterium. Now these, handle, these friendly or healthy microbes coat the gastrointestinal tract like a thick turf wall. And they are responsible for the final breakdown of our food, particularly releasing the B vitamins. These microbes are responsible for the absorption of our food out of the gut and through into the blood. These microbes are responsible for protecting the blood against harmful pathogens that may be in the gut. These microbes are responsible for the nourishment of the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. And these little cells are, are made down here. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she calls that the nursery where the new cell is made. It travels on up and then away it goes every three to five days. This is why I call this the grand finale of digestion. Can you see the importance of that gut flora? But unfortunately today, there are many things that are destroying gut flora. What would destroy gut flora? Antibiotics. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the week, I'm not against antibiotics. They save lives. But most people go, should go through their whole life never even having them. They should be kept only for life-saving events. But how many people take it several times every year? Praise God that antibiotics do not help viruses. Otherwise, we'd probably be inundated with it at the moment. I just got an email from a friend. She said, are you OK, Barbara? I hear Florida's in shutdown. I said, oh, that's news to me. Everything seems to be going on as normal. C can you see the madness of what is happening at the moment? It, how can something be an epidemic when there's more deaths on the road, there's more deaths in hospitals than are happening with this coronavirus? So be careful that you're not caught up in the fear because God has said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So antibiotics... Someone, well, one writer said, taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. And what did the atomic bomb kill? The good and the bad alike. And that's what it does. What else kills the gut flora? Cortisone or your prednisones. What also kills gut flora is the statin drugs. They're the cholesterol-lowering medications. Tomorrow night we'll be looking at them in detail. Also, long-term painkiller cut can uh, also kill off the gut flora. One lady said, well, I get a tick for all of that. So when that gut flora is now compromised because of a breakdown, because of these drugs, we now have a compromise in the break final breakdown of our food. We now have a compromise compromising the absorption of our food out of the gut and into the blood, we've now lost our border protection. And the cells have lost their proper nourishment. So there is an answer in medicine today. It's called fecal transplant. <coughs> Have you heard of it? A man rang me up, he said, my 15-year-old daughter, we gave her a fecal transplant last year, it cost $10,000. Hmm? He said, uh, and then last winter, she doesn't eat very well and she won't drink water and she got a very bad cold. Have you noticed the coronavirus more takes down the elderly and the sick who've already got a compromised immune system? When that gut floor is compromised, your immune system is compromised. 
And so she took an antibiotic and now she's back to square one. Can you help? Do you know what my first question was? Is she willing to come? Is she willing to change? Ah, oh, well, I'm working on it, he says. She didn't come. What is a fecal transplant? When you've got, now sometimes this is called leaky gut. Can you see why it's leaking? You've lost that, that proper gut flora. Things are leaking into the blood that shouldn't be because you've lost your border protection. So what do they do in a fecal transplant? They, they take the fecal matter from a healthy colon. And I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but this is exactly what happens. They put it in a blender with a bit of water. And then they put it in a great big fat syringe that's about that big. And then they put the person under anaesthetic and they inject it into their colon. Uh, it costs you $10,000. But we live in a body that's designed to heal itself. And when someone has a very compromised gut, often you know it because instead of, as Dr. Kellogg said, three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations, the person is going 10 times a day to the bathroom. That's one of the signs. So what do you do? Number one, stop. There are three foods that act like kerosene to a fire on a compromised gut flora. One is the hybridized wheat, the other is dairy, and the other is refined sugar. Have I written this before? Aha, mm -hmm. aha, uh -huh, uh -huh. just checking. <laughs> Two, probiotic. Probiotic means for life. That's a powder that contains lactobacillus ophilus, lacto lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. It's a powder. And you can get powders that have got billions in them. And number three, Psalm 104, verse 14, verse 114, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. There is a herb called slippery elm. And slippery elm contains a growth stimulant. And when you put water with slippery elm, it goes uh, a little thick. And that, it goes a little slippery, you could say. And it coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gastrointestinal tract and it puts a little bit of firmness to someone who has diarrhoea. So let me give you a story to illustrate. We had a man do our program and I said to him, what is your reason for coming to our health retreat? He said, I'm just here to support my wife. I said, oh, he was... 68. I said, are you on any medication? He said, yes, I'm on anti-inflammatories and I'm on cortisone because I have irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, how many times do you go to the bathroom a day? He said, oh, eight. Now, this is while on the medication. He said, I go for a walk along the beach every morning and I know exactly where the bathrooms are because I've got four stops in my first hour on my warm morning walk. Oh, I say, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, I have a cup of coffee and a um, slice of toast with butter and jam. Can you see we've got all of these happening here? Yeah. I said, uh, what do you have mid-morning? Because that won't take you far. Oh, I usually have a cake or a croissant, muffin, another cup of coffee. What do you have for lunch? Oh, I usually have a sandwich with ham and cheese on it and maybe a, a cake. Can you see what we're ticking every box here? I said, oh, and what do you have mid-afternoon? Oh, another cup of coffee, oh, maybe tea, because I don't want to interview with my sleep, and maybe a muffin or a cake. Oh, what do you have at night? Oh, I have a steak and maybe pasta and maybe some bread and maybe ice cream and chocolate flavouring for dessert, and I always like a scotch at night. Oh, I say. I don't say much more because he doesn't know. Many are sick through ignorance. 
I'm just praising God. He's at our health retreat. Of course, guess what? We don't serve any wheat. We don't serve any dairy. And we don't serve any refined sugar. And we don't serve any caffeine. And we don't serve any alcohol. And some people say, well, you're taking all the fun out of life. i tell you about fun. Fun is, even in your 70s, being able to climb mountains with your grandchildren. Amen. Fun is feeling good from the moment you wake up till the moment you go to bed. Isn't that fun? Mm-hmm. This man can't go anywhere because he can only go somewhere that's got a bathroom nearby. Mm-hmm. He can't climb mountains with his grandchildren. So what I did was I said to him, do you mind if I try a few things? He said, no. He said, because I went to the doctor recently and he can do no more for me. So I put him on slippery elm four times a day. First two days were juices. So the first day in the afternoon, I said, how are things going, mate? He said, oh, it's quite good. He said, instead of going eight times a day, I've gone six. I wondered how he'd go. We're just giving him juice. So Tuesday afternoon, how are you going? He said, I've only gone five times today. And he said, I'm not bleeding from the colon anymore. And he said, oh, I don't have any more cramps. So Wednesday, our guests begin to eat. So middle of the day, how are you going? He said, I only had to go twice on my morning walk. He said, I'm feeling quite good. I said, because you are feeling so good, why don't you stop your anti-inflammatories? Very safe environment. We're watching you carefully. Now, if he started to go 10 times a day, you know what we do? We give him step realm every hour. Because what we're doing is we're showing him what he can do without the meds. Or if he's very concerned, he can just go back on half meds. Can you see you're playing with this? Thursday, how are you going? He said, fantastic. He said, there's form in my stools. <laughs> he hadn't seen that for years. Friday, how are you going? He said, extremely well. I said, why don't you drop your cortisone a bit? He was on 20 milligrams of cortisone. You can't stop cortisone. I said, why don't you try... 15, because he was on five milligram tablets. He was having two in the morning, two in the afternoon. He did. Saturday, how are you going? Fantastic. Wow, isn't that incredible? And he's been battling this for 30 years, late 60s. Doctor had just said he could do no more for him. And so Sunday morning, I came to have breakfast with the guests and he came running up to me. He said, I just went on my morning walk and I haven't gone yet. <laughs> wow. That's impressive, isn't it? So what does he do now? I don't have to say a word. Is that right? I don't have to say a word. Do I have to tell him to stop having his scotch? Do I have to tell him to stop eating that? Do I have to tell him that? No, he heard it all in the lectures. I say, the choice is yours, mate. He was excited. Scotch is not that interesting to him anymore. <laughs> At the retreat, we showed him life without bread, life without dairy, life without refined sugar. And I have to tell you that our guests tell us it's the most beautiful food they've ever eaten. Hmm? Food should be good, is that right? Yeah. It should taste good. Absolutely. And it should be such that it's going to heal our bodies, not harm our bodies. I gave this lecture one evening in New Zealand, Tuesday night. A 70-year-old woman came up and she said, I've had Crohn's disease for 30 years. She said, the things you mentioned tonight I have never heard. So Wednesday morning, in fact, on her way home from the meeting Tuesday night, she went and she bought some, some rice for breakfast because she was having all of this. This little lady wasn't having scotch, <laughs> but she was having just about everything else. The man told me, she said, no one ever told me this. 
friend of mine wanted to do a nutrition course. She rang up the school. She said, I want the name of one of your students. She rang up the student. She said, I want you to go to your textbook. I want you to go to the back. I want you to tell me who funded the studies in your nutritional textbook. And the student said, ah, the dairy industry and the grain industry and the cereal industry and the sugar industry. Huh? Yeah. That's why you're the doctor. It's got to make sense. So this little lady, with 73, she immediately implemented this the next day. It's the best thing she'd ever heard. Tuesday night, Thursday night she came up to me at the end of the meeting with this big smile on her face. She said, my bleeding from my colon stopped, my cramping has stopped. She said, I've gone from eight bowel movements a day down to five in two days. And she's in her 70s. Wow. Now she's not healed, but what's her body just saying to her? Yes. You're on the right track. So there's no need to spend $10,000 on a fecal transplant. All you have to do is give your gut the right conditions and it will begin to heal. It will begin to heal. Remember, nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. But these two stories I've just told you, that was not slow. You see, the only thing that is touching your gastrointestinal tract is the food you're eating. And there are some foods that irritate. When someone has a very inflamed gastrointestinal tract, they can't even eat raw food. That can be a little harsh, so they might just have to start with cooked food. When I was at Eden Valley four weeks ago, we had a lady come with Crohn's disease. She'd just come from the hospital because they'd put her on cortisone. She swelled up. It gave her reflux. She got abdominal pain. She was rushed to hospital. They put her on antibiotics. Oh, what's that going to do to her? And then Sunday morning, she came to our retreat. She was thin. She was 40. So we immediately put her on the slippery arm. We actually gave her capsules. We said, you can take two capsules every hour, every half hour if you want. For lunch, she just had a pumpkin soup and a mung bean noodles with a pesto sauce. The next morning, she said to me, I went 10 times last night. Ooh. Sometimes food that normally would be all right isn't all right because of what's happened the last few days. First two days, she just had juices. And she had the slippery arm. I think she took four capsules, four times a day. Monday night she slept. She said, this is the first night that I have slept. I cannot remember how long. That lady was with us for two weeks. She did not go ten times again. She had no more abdominal pain. We just gave her soups and steamed vegetables. That's all we gave her. We were treading very carefully. She just emailed me a week ago. She's gone back to work. Wow. She was on no meds because the medication just made her so sick. This is irritable bowel or Crohn's disease or colitis or gastritis. They are all inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. There is another herb that can be quite soothing and healing, and that is aloe vera. And I notice here aloe vera grows quite a lot, doesn't it? And I'm going to bring a big leaf of aloe vera to our, uh, our herb lecture tomorrow morning between 10 and 12 and show you how that can be prepared. So what if, oh, by the way, let's look at the appendix for a moment. God doesn't make mistakes, does he? And the appendix is not a mistake. The appendix plays an important role in the gut. What does it do? 
It has two main roles. The appendix is called the colon's oil can because it lubricates the contents as it goes through and the appendix releases antibacterial fluid. So if what's coming out of the small intestine is pretty toxic, why would it be? Because the person's eating meat. Meat putrefies. A dog can get away with it because they've only got one yard long gastrointestinal tract and they've got six times the hydrochloric acid we have. They can get away with it. We cannot. So by the time that meat comes down here, it's pretty toxic. And because it is so toxic, the appendix has to release a lot of antibacterial fluid to calm it down, to keep it safe by the time it gets out of you. Now, if that person had a big steak for the meal and then they're drinking some wine with the meal and maybe have some ice cream and chocolate flavouring afterwards and a cup of coffee, can you see that's feeding the putrefaction process and what comes out of there is pretty bad. God is so good because he, that's a, that's a double layer valve there. So what comes out of there, it can't go back. And what comes out of your small intestine really should just be waste. And when it comes out, it is liquid. So one of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. So that when you pass, it has form. But if someone's dehydrated, more water gets taken out than should be taken out. And what do we end up with then? Um, rabbit pellets, cement. So let's go to the other end of the equation now. What if someone's only going once every two days? What did Dr. Kellogg say? Three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. And if you notice that the colon has a mind of its own, if you're not going enough and you tell it to go, it won't. And if it's going 10 times a day and you tell it to stop, it won't. The colon has a mind of its own. So the colon needs gentle stimulation. So how do we stimulate the colon? Let's have a look at how you can stimulate the colon. Water, when you're well hydrated, that has a stimulating effect on the colon. We should be eating, sorry, drinking at least eight glasses, eight, eight ounce glasses a day. Not all at once. If you drink it all at once in the morning, you'll be dehydrated by the end of the day. This is what I do. I wake up in the morning, I have half a glass of water. I go to the bathroom, I, then I have another half glass of water. Then I get dressed and have another half a glass of water. Then I pray and have another half a glass of water. And then I'm reading my Bible. Can you see what you do? You spread it out all through the day. It's so easy to drink it that way. And before every single glass, we should have a little crystal of Celtic salt. I was in Whole Foods the other day. They have quite a nice range of salts and they have the Celtic salt. Tomorrow night when I look at the heart, I'm going to show you that salt is not a problem as long as it's whole salt. Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. It's a balancing salt. So just a little before every glass of water. The colon also needs to be swept and fibre sweeps the colon. So your high fibre foods are your plant foods. So all your vegetables and your fruits and your whole grains, your nuts and your seeds. There's your fibre. Because you see the colon has all these little grooves and it needs to be swept every day. And fibre sweeps the colon. The colon also needs to relax. And you know a good way to relax the colon is laughter. What does the proverb say? A merry heart. In fact, it's uh, 1722. A merry heart do doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. I'd like to suggest that a broken spirit dries up the colon. <laughs> we should laugh more. What's the old saying? If we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. Laugh. 
Do you know children laugh 125 times a day? So should we. Laugh more. The colon also needs you to exercise. When you exercise, you increase the circulation of the blood to the colon and when you exercise, you give the colon a lovely massage, especially crunches. I'm going to investigate tomorrow night. Are we all doing our crunches? Crunches are so easy. All you have to do is lift your head a couple of inches off the ground. Do it until your stomach muscles scream at you. And I'm hoping in the next couple of days I'll see people walking around like that. No pain, no gain. When you do crunches, when you twist, we should all do twisting exercises. Rebounding, rebounding is one of the best exercises. When you're jumping on that little trampoline, every jump, the colon's going like this. Position, what do I mean by position? There is a muscle, and this muscle is called puborectalis. And this muscle holds up the last part of the colon. And we're so glad for puborectalis because if it wasn't for puborectalis, one would easily have an accident and we do not want that. When you're sitting on the throne, here's the throne. When you're sitting on the throne in the morning, doing your daily evacuation, puborectalis remains taunt. And we know the contents comes out. But if you sit on the throne in the morning and you have in front of your throne a little stool or you can go to Bed Bath and Beyond and buy a squatty potty which, which causes you to mimic the squatting position so your knees are up in the air that relaxes puborectalis. And when puborectalis relaxes, that allows the colon to open internally and the contents can up pass with ease. And you will find in many countries, in European countries, in Asian countries, many still squat. When I was in Singapore, you could go to the Westerner toilets or you could go to the local ones and the local ones are just a hole in the floor. It's all tiled, it's all flush, but they squat. In Africa, I saw the same thing. In India, I saw the same thing. When you squat, and squatty potty makes it easy, it's just like a little round stool that fits around the toilet and you can pull it out when you use it, push it in when you're not. When you squat, it relaxes puborectalis, which opens the colon, but it also does something else. It takes all the pressure off the anus. And when the pressure is on the anus, when too much pressure is on that area, it weakens the anus and also hemorrhoids can happen. So let's say someone's sitting on the throne and they haven't been for two days and they decide to help things along a little bit and put a little bit of pressure, all that does is weaken the anal sphincter and cause hemorrhoids. So if a person hasn't been for a few days, what should they do? Do you know the quickest and the easiest is just to have a warm water enema. But at the same time, the question has to be asked, why? Why aren't they going? Is it because they're not drinking enough water? Is it because they're so stressed? Is it because they're not eating a high fibre diet? Is it because they're not exercising? The detective hat has to be put on to investigate why these things are so. In my book, Self Heal by Design, there is the recipe for a tea that we call colon tea. And colon tea contains herbs, that gently stimulate peristalsis. It's one part cascara sagrada. Yes, cascara sagrada is a very bitter herb, but there's two part licorice, and licorice is not a bitter herb, it's actually a very sweet herb, and three part buckthorn. And buckthorn is a relative of the cascara, but it is not as bitter. So this is a root 
and these are barks, so they all need to be boiled. So you would buy those herbs and mix them in a jar. And then one teaspoon of the herb, so one teaspoon of the herbs to one cup of water. And because they are barks and roots, they need a gentle simmer, so simmer for 10 minutes. And then we use it at our health retreats. I'll be in Eden Valley next week and they use it there. You take one cup of this before you go to sleep at night. And usually you will evacuate in the morning. And we say to our guests, if you haven't evacuated by the middle of the day, have another cup. Some people need half a cup, some people need one cup, some people need two cups. A psychologist came and did our program back in Australia a few years ago and she was going once a week with help. So what we did was we gave her three cups of the tea a day. We also put a castoral compress on her abdomen overnight. We also at Misty Mountain have a treatment called a colonic irrigation, which is like a water treatment into the colon to help loosen things. She started to go. In fact, she started to go twice a day. She was so excited. She had not known such a thing for about 35 years. The lady was in her 60s. By the end of the week, the whites of her eyes became white. They'd been grey. Her complexion became pink. She said, I cannot believe how good I feel. What would your house be like if you didn't empty the rubbish every week? And that's what it is. It's an organ of elimination. It must be eliminating regularly. She emailed me back what happened to her. When she went home, she changed her diet. She went to a plant-based diet. She started to drink more water. She started to exercise. But often, that is not enough. The cells are in the habit. You've got to change that habit. And that's what the herbs do. Praise God for the herbs that he gave us specifically for different functions. So she took three cups a day, morning, middle of the day, night, and she said that got her going twice a day. She said after four weeks, she started going four times a day. So she brought it back to two cups a day. After another four or five weeks, she started going four times a day. So she brought it back to one cup a day. After six weeks, she started going four times a day. So she stopped the tea. She said after four months, she was on no more tea. So these herbs gently revive and restore colon function. At first, she had to take it to go. But because she took it regularly, did the castoral compress, changed the diet and the lifestyle, see the detective hat has to be put on to find out what, how did we get to this. She said to me, my mind is so clear, maybe this is the problem with most of my patients. She was a psychologist, remember? <laughs> and it is true. When the body's not working properly, it affects the mind. And on Saturday morning, I'm going to go to the mind and show you how just as everything in the body affects the mind, the way we think actually can affect the functioning of our mind. And that's why laughter is one of the things to do for a tight colon. In fact, my colonic irrigationist teacher. She died at the age of, I think, mid-90s. She taught me when she was 80. She used to say, tight mind, tight colon. <laughs> Relax. So what can you do for hemorrhoids? There's a few things you can do for hemorrhoids. By the squatty potty, and then you take off all pressure off the area. But you can Get a cotton ball, you know the cotton wool balls? And you can soak it in castor oil and shape it the shape of your little finger and freeze it. It'll take three days to freeze. Once it's frozen, just before bed, the person inserts it into the colon and they leave it there all night. And in the morning when they do their daily evacuation, it will come out and that castor oil oils and soothes the whole area. So when someone does it, they might 
you know, freeze maybe a dozen at a time. Another thing you can do is get a slab of uh, aloe vera, about the size of your little finger, freeze it, and it can also work as a pessary. So a person might do castor oil one night and aloe vera the next night. Both aloe vera and castor oil are very soothing and healing to the lining of the gut. And so ends our journey of the gastrointestinal tract. I trust you've enjoyed the journey. I trust your eyes have been opened. And I trust the Proverbs, Proverbs 14 verse 6, makes more sense to you now that knowledge is easy to him that understands. We have time for a few questions before we close. Are there any questions? Yes. What about if someone doesn't have the appendix? We live in such an amazing body that has the ability to adapt and adjust. If the appendix has been taken, the body does adapt and adjust, but one must ever be careful to give that colon the right conditions. Because many people who have lost their appendix find that they tend to constipation. So be careful on how you handle the gut. It's like some people have lost their gallbladder, but the body will adapt and adjust because the liver does make bile. So the body does adapt and adjust to that. I'm a colonic irrigational therapist. I used to be in Australia before I had a ban put on me. And one day a lady wanted a colonic irrigation and she said, I have no large intestine. So they had had cancer, so they had joined her small intestine, joined it to the last part of her colon. So I rang my teacher up and I said, I've got a lady who wants a colonic irrigation and she has no large intestine, what do you think? She said, try it, see what happens. So I very successfully gave her a colonic irrigation with no large intestine. <laughs> the body adapts and adjusts, that's what it does. Surgery's come a long way, granted. <laughs> but ideally, we look after our bodies, keep them in the right conditions, so we actually don't have to get to that surgery. Yes? If you talk loud, I'll repeat the question. How effective is fasting? It's a good question. So at our retreats, and while I'm in America, I run a retreat in Alabama, that's Living Springs, and next week I'll be in Eden Valley, which is in Denver, Colorado. And both of those retreats are running their program the same as we do at Misty Mountain. So the first two days are juicing. So our guests come in and they have a meal at 1.30 on Sunday and then they don't eat again till Wednesday morning. We give them juices every two hours. So this is carrot, celery, and apple juice. I mentioned it the other day, 80 carrot, 10 celery, 10 apple. Sometimes we add a little bit of ginger, sometimes we add cucumber, sometimes we ha add greens. And the reason why our guests fast is so that all the body's energies that usually go to digestion go to cleansing and healing the body. That's, fasting has been used for centuries. Now both, uh, both the st two of the stories I told you tonight, the lady that come to our retreat a few, years, few weeks ago at Eden Valley with Crohn's disease, she was with us two weeks, so she did two lots of two days fasting and that really gave her gut a rest. I wondered if on the juices she would get diarrhea because it's just juice, but not so because she was taking the slippery elm as well. But I believe, do you remember we gave her even a good meal on Sunday and she went 10 times. I said, your gut needs a rest. And sometimes in very severe cases of Crohn's disease, the person will be put into hospital, they'll be put on a drip and may be given no food for a week just to give that gut a rest. Because remember, the only thing that's touching that gut is the food that you are eating. 
So when someone has Crohn's disease or any inflammation of the colon or even constipation, the fasting is excellent for the healing of the gut. And if that person prone to constipation, they will fast, but they will also take this tea. But the lady with Crohn's disease, no, no, we do not give that tea. <laughs> we give the slippery arm. Yes? The B12 shot, is that any good? B12 shot. Now, if someone's very low in B12, they may need that. But if someone's very low in B12, there's really no need to have a B12 shot because you can get sublingual B12. Now, do you, do you remember I said you need the intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid to absorb your B12? You can get sublingual B12, which means it's absorbed in the mouth, which, which means it bypasses the need for hydrochloric acid and bypasses the need for the intrinsic factor. But at the same time, I would advise boosting hydrochloric acid so that your acid and your intrinsic factor are now made so you can absorb your own B12. So definitely if someone is low, they in may initially need, need a boost. But if it was me, I would go more for the sublingual shots than the injection. And if someone's continually needing B12 shots, they're not looking at the cause as to why they're low. And usually it is low hydrochloric acid. You just talk loud, I can hear you. Is there a difference between herbs and spices? An example of herbs. Herbs are usually um, your milder herbs. So your culinary herbs will be basil, you say basil. <laughs> Oregano, you say oregano, is that right? So th these are culinary herbs. The spices are more classified as probably chili pepper, cayenne pepper, gingers, mustards, and some of those are healing and some of those are irritating. So let me just give you the irritants. The irritants is chili, the irritants is black pepper, and the irritant is mustard. All the other spicy, more heating ones are not irritants. And you'll notice in the digestive tea, ginger was there. Ginger can be very calming on the gut, even though it's probably considered a spice. Yes? Uh, what, what benefit do you get from a shot of wheatgrass? What benefit do you get a sh from a shot of wheatgrass? Let me show you, because this is very interesting. Because remember what should be on the tip of our lips? Why? This is the molecular structure of human blood. And this is the molecular structure of plant blood. And plant blood is chlorophyll. So wheatgrass, green barleys, all of those greens, the, the green is chlorophyll. So what's the difference? In human blood, the middle molecule is iron. In plant blood, the middle molecule is magnesium. So the only real difference between plant blood and human blood is the middle molecules. So a good, well obviously if someone is on death's door they may need a blood transfusion, but if someone's anemic they can take green drinks and it'll help to, it'll help to get them up. What about mushroom? Mushroom is a fungus. If someone has cancer or a yeast presence in their body, I would advise no on mushrooms. But if someone has nice, strong hydrochloric acid and don't have a yeast problem and don't have cancer, to have mushrooms occasionally, it's fine. Yeah? <coughs> what is... What if someone's B12 is high? Um, I'm not aware of a danger of that. Yes, um, about H. pylori, what causes um, uh -huh. someone to have H. pylori? Did you know that Helicobacter pylori is in all of us? And let me show you about a man who ha came to us with Helicobacter pylori. When you're dehydrated, the lining of the stomach gets very thin. And when the lining of the stomach gets very thin, it's easy for acid 
to eat holes in the stomach lining. And as we looked at on Monday night, whenever cell damage happens in the body, our body's own microbes can evolve into a clean-up form or a bacterial form. So if someone has uh, stomach ulcers and they have damage there, then Helicobacter pylori comes to clean it up. And so what happens is, and so they do a breath test, oh, they've got Helicobacter pylori, they're given antibiotics. So antibiotics come along and kill the Helicobacter pylori. But because the damage is still there, more Helicobacter pylori happens. And so all you really have to do is drink adequate water so that you get that nice thick lining Boost your hydrochloric acid because the hydrochloric acid will kill off any unwanted Helicobacter pylori. I've been dialing with a lady emailing me at the moment. She said that she tested positive for Helicobacter pylori. She's already had two courses of antibiotics. It's still there. And her doctor said if she doesn't take another antibiotic, then she could get stomach cancer and die. Now, we should never make a decision on fear. Mm-hmm, on facts. So the question has to be asked, why is the Helicobacter pylori present in the stomach? Is it because the person's dehydrated? Is it because they've got low hydrochloric acid? Yes? Is there a code from the fifty-hour salad? So she's been told she's got it because she has too much salad. Well, that makes absolutely no sense to me. The bacteria lives in the salad. If you've got nice, strong hydrochloric acid, what's that going to do to bacteria? Kill it. That's right. Yes? How safe is it to drink only alkaline water if you're a vegan? Your stomach is only acid when it's digesting and when you smell, taste food, then the acid's released. So drinking alkaline water in the morning is not a problem because your stomach's not acid yet. Well, if you drink it close to a meal, it'll certainly uh, reduce your hydrochloric acid. On Friday night, I'm going to look at the acid-alkaline balance and you'll see there the most effective way to alkaline your body. Yes? What, what about Himalayan sea, sea salt? Himalayan salt has 75 minerals, so it's very close to the Celtic salt. And if you can't get Himalayan, um, sorry, Celtic, then Himalayan is almost as good. Pardon? Sea salt. Sea salt. How many minerals does it have? You see... Seawater has 92 minerals, and the first crystals formed are sodium chloride because sodium makes up 30%, chloride makes up 50%. So they scoop the sodium chloride up, bleach it white, put aluminium with it, and call it sea salt. <laughs> it has 75 minerals. I just mentioned that. B vitamins. There's a book called The Calcium Lie by Dr. Robert Thompson. And in his book, he shows that we can get all our minerals and vitamins from our foods as long as we are eating organic foods. And your B vitamins, the highest source is your raw nuts and seeds. That's when you get a nice range of your B vitamins. Also, your whole grains have some. Yes? So if you taste between, if you taste <laughs> the food that you're cooking, I actually don't taste my food. I guess 
I've got a fairly good idea of what it will taste like. But you're better to taste it just before, maybe in the 15 minutes before you're going to eat. Because it is true, even one nut will start up the whole process. So that's why you are best to keep breaks between meals. And if you're feeling hungry, have a big glass of water. Have a little bit of salt and a glass of water. But just make sure every meal contains adequate fiber, protein, and fat. If you just have an apple for breakfast, you're going to be hungry in, in an hour. If you just have a bowl of cereal for breakfast, you're going to be hungry in about two hours. You need to have substantial meals so that you can go the distance. Yes? I want to ask about distilled water, if it's OK. Distilled water, I don't think there's any need to drink distilled water. You just drink your, your I, I guess in Florida, the best thing is to have water filters, yeah? Because uh, your water would have um, fluoride in it and chlorine in it, yeah? Up at Misty Mountain, we just drink <laughs> beautiful water, yeah? Yes, interesting. Can you get B12 first thing in the morning? When we wake up in the morning, we have B12 between our teeth. It's a bacteria. And so your first glass of water, you're probably getting a little bit. Don't clean your teeth when you wake up in the morning. Why would someone clean their teeth when they wake up in the morning? Because they ate too late, they're not drinking enough water, and their breath is so bad, they've got to clean their teeth because they can't stand themselves. So that's why you look why. Why is, why is your so bad. Have you heard of oil pulling? Putting coconut oil in your mouth and swish, swish, swishing? You can, you can certainly do that. Yes? What is the best water to drink? I guess the best is to get filtered water and the best water filter is the one that will get the fluoride out. Um, I know reverse osmosis will get the fluoride out of the water. If you can have beautiful water, your family will drink more water. On Friday night, I'm going to look at the acid-alkaline balance, and I'm going to show how it's too many acid foods um, that really create this, uh, the kidney stones. Is it good to drink water all through the night? Well, some people say if they drink water all through the night, they're getting up all through the night. I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> I know some people that can drink six, 16 ounces before they go to bed and not even get up in the night. Well, not me. <laughs> so I drink most of my water in the middle of the day. That's the, in the beginning of the day. You're, you know, you're the doctor there. You just, uh, yes? Um, if you're eating non-organic and you put it in apple cider vinegar, does that help? A little bit. But the problem is that you're not getting the nutrients out of your food because organic food feeds the soil. And for instance, one organic tomato will give you nine times the iron as a conventionally grown tomato. So the apple cider vinegar may negate somewhat the the um, pesticides, but you, you're not getting the nutrients out of your food that your organic will give you. So there's a whole, there's a whole lot of areas. Yes? Your, your liver requires two cups of water to make enough digestive juices for a meal. But yesterday I had to drink two cups of water for my liver to make enough gastric juice for breakfast today. And yesterday I had to drink another two cups of water so the liver could make enough gastric juice for lunch today. So it's actually the day before's hydration that influences the production of your gastric juices. And that's just for digestion, that's for not all other processes. You might be familiar with um, ah, 
Thomas Jackson, he's a nutritionist from down in Tennessee. He says, eat melons alone or leave melons alone. <laughs> So the melons don't really go well with other foods, but maybe on a summer evening, some watermelon can be a very light pauper-type supper. But that, that's why it's good to have a combination. So my breakfast this morning was, we got some yellow berries. I think they're gooseberries. They're very nice. They're in Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or something. So we, we had... Uh, raspberries and gooseberries and strawberries and blueberries and chia seed all over that and then we had a slice of spelt toast with olive oil and avocado and red lentils on top and some almonds see that's very high in fiber that's some nice moist foods it's got your proteins that feels very good on the stomach and i do not get hungry for five to six hours so that's what the food should be. Now I notice that it's past time. So let me close in prayer. Oh, there's one little hand up the back. We'll just take one more question, yes? Big loud voice. What about when you eat juice? Yeah, juice really should take the place of food. If you eat dessert and drink juice, you're putting high sugar in your body because you look at how many fruits it took to make that juice. But also, there's a lot of liquid in there and that does dilute somewhat your hydrochloric acid. You won't need juice with your meal if you are well hydrated when you sit. So on Sabbath morning when everyone goes to church, between church and Sabbath school, that's when everyone should be drinking lots of water. And yet how many people don't? And then at the meal, they're wanting lots of juice. So let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for our gastrointestinal tract. Thank you so much for providing, providing the herbs that are able to heal. And thank you so much for the nourishing food that we can eat and yet taste good. Thank you, Father. May we each look after our gastrointestinal tract is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.